Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, like Andy just said, my name's Jordan, uh, and I work at Microsoft's Offensive Secu Security Research Team. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about exploiting Hyper-V. And you might be wondering, okay, uh, you work at Microsoft, what, where are you talking about this, what's the point? And so it turns out uh, this team that I work on, uh, Microsoft OSR, you probably have not heard of, but we um, are continuously writing exploits for Microsoft products. And the whole idea behind that is that we are hoping to, that by developing these exploits ourselves, we will be able to get ahead of attackers and try to figure out not only where vulnerabilities are, but also what kind of exploit techniques will be necessary to exploit these vulnerabilities, right? And if we are able to do that, then we can come up with mitigation strategies, mit mitigation technology that we can implement in Windows before these attack techniques are actually used in the wild. And so uh, Hyper-V is um, a target that we had um, you know, last year, and um, I feel like it's a pretty good example of our work uh, in terms of you know, di diving, diving deep into a component, finding some vulnerabilities, exploiting those vulnerabilities, and then using our learnings from this whole operation and uh, applying them to Windows in, in order to harden it. And so uh, that's basically, you know, I just basically laid out the entire uh, talk for you. We're going to be looking at vulnerabilities in Hyper-V. We're going to be exploiting them, and then we are going to be uh, talking about how we can make Windows better and harder to exploit in this context. In addition to that, uh, there will be a live demo uh, towards the end of the talk, so please don't leave. The live demo will be pretty cool. And um, yeah, let's get going. So the first thing is, uh, if we want to talk about Hyper-V, we need to actually understand what Hyper-V is. And I don't expect any of you in the audience to be like intimately familiar with the, um, well, you know, all the details of how Hyper-V works. So I'm going to start very, very high level. Essentially, this is Hyper-V, right? If you were to use Hyper-V on your desktop machine, this is what you would see. You have your own little desktop up there, and you have a little window, and in that little window, you have your own like little other desktop, right? And so what's going on here is you have the host operating system, which is hosting these virtual machines, and in that window you have the guest operating system, which is running inside of one of those virtual machines. And so what Hyper-V is, is it's the virtualization stack that makes it possible for that guest operating system to run. If you want to look at it from a slightly more detailed point of view, uh, this is what you would get. To the left, you have the host operating system, once again. To the right, you have the guest operating system. And what you can see is that the host operating system is able to talk to hardware directly, for the most part, and uh, the guest operating system is not. Both of them are able to talk to this thing called the hypervisor, which is kind of a, you know, a blob in there. It's uh, you know, a level of security superior to the kernel. It has its own memory. Like Even the host operating system is not meant to be able to mess with that. And so the hypervisor is able to talk to hardware, the host operating system is able to talk to hardware, but the guest OS is not. And uh, you might be wondering, okay, well, that's cool, that makes sense, except it doesn't, because what if uh, a program in my guest OS wants to access network? What if it wants to access a storage? It has to be able to do that somehow. Uh, and so let's take an example of this uh, process, food.exe, which is running in user mode in, uh, in the guest OS. So food.exe wants to access a file off of uh, off a hard disk, right? Uh, it's going to do that by you know, using some, some system calls to talk to the guest operating system. The guest OS typically would just go and talk directly to the, uh, the hard drive. Unfortunately, like I just mentioned a couple times, the guest OS does not have access to hardware. So what happens instead is the IO stack in the uh, kernel guest OS is going to talk to this driver that lives in the guest OS kernel that's called store VSC. Uh, so VSC in this context stands for virtualization service client um, or consumer or one of those two. And basically the idea is that this store VSC is going to kind of provide an interface that looks like a hard drive and is instead going to talk to this big blob in the middle called VM bus. And VM bus you can think of as a communication channel between the guest and the host. Right? And so then on the other end of the MBUS, of course, in the host, you're going to have the equivalent to store VSC that lives in the host, store VSP. And so in this case, VSP is virtualization service provider. And basically, that's just going to decode whatever it is that store VSC is asking for and then do that operation on the guest kernel. It's going to go through its own I.O. stack and then it's going to jump into uh, the hardware. So it's going to talk to the hard disk, get the sectors that the, um, you know, the, the guest OS might be asking for, and that's just going to be that. 
which is cool. If you think about this like a, uh, a sandbox model, you can really think about the host OS as being, um, you know, being a broker, right? It has the ability to intercept every IO access, essentially, that the guest OS is going to have, and so it can decide, okay, I want you to be able to access this piece of hardware, I want you to be able to access this piece of hardware, but not necessarily like this other piece of hardware, right? And in the middle of that, of course, the guest OS does not have access to all of memory. It only has access to a few CPU cores, which are, is decided by the hypervisor. And so, yeah, we, we have like a very tight grip on what the guest OS has access to or not. Now the thing is, I just talked about VM bus as like this kind of blob communications channel between the host and the guest. Uh, didn't really explain how it works, and that's kind of important. The thing is, you might be thinking, okay, if you looked at that last slide, we actually have the guest OS and the host OS have access to the hypervisor, right? So we might as well just use the hypervisor as that communication channel. Of course, you don't really want to do that because context switches into the hypervisor all the time are kind of expensive. So instead, what you're going to do is use this concept of shared memory between the guest and the host. And basically what's gonna, what's gonna be happening there is you're just gonna pick a piece of memory in physical memory and you're going to be able to map it in both the host's uh, memory space and the guest memory space. Once that happens, you can kind of have VM bus interpret that piece of memory as a ring buffer, which means that, you know, you, you're just gonna copy a packet into it and another packet and another packet and then for once you run out of space, you just start, start over. Uh, and so based on that, transferring data to and from the host is pretty simple. You just have this packet in your VSC, you copy it into the ring buffer. Since that piece of memory is shared, the packet just like magically shows up everywhere this piece of memory is mapped at, and then the host will be alerted that there's a packet in there, it's going to grab it, interpret it, do whatever it wants with it, and then that'll be that. The only problem with that is, of course, since we have the ring buffer, and you know, this, these machines are highly, well, you know, modern machines have a lot of threads, a lot of uh, different components might want to be able to talk to the, uh, the host OS, um, and using a ring buffer for that is kind of problematic if you're gonna be locking the ring buffer constantly in order to talk to, um, to the host OS uh, side of things, you are not gonna be able to send a lot of packets at least not a lot of packets that are really big, because if you're gonna be constantly copying memory in and out of the ring buffer, well, that takes time, everything is serialized because it's ring buffer, and that's not ideal. So in order to, pal to, to like deal with that problem, uh, we introduced this concept of shared memory that is that can be sent from the guest to the host through VM bus. And so you have this kind of thing there, the GPADL, I call it a GPADL, uh, that stands for Guest Physical Address uh, Descriptor List. If you're familiar with, um, with Windows kernel lingo, this is basically an MDL that can span uh, you know, the, uh, the boundary between the host and the guest. So the idea is that the guest is going to allocate this piece of memory, is going to say, okay, I want to send that piece of memory over to the host, and instead of copying that memory in and out of the ring buffer, it's, go it's just going to basically give a reference to that piece of memory. And then that piece of memory is going to be mapped into the host OS, and the host OS at that point can do whatever it wants with it. It can copy memory out of it, it can copy memory into it, it can keep it mapped or unmap it or whatever, and that's basically the way you're gonna be able to send larger amounts of data at a higher, higher frequency than you would be able to with just the ring buffer. So at this point, you are essentially Hyper-V experts. At least uh, as far as I'm concerned, because I'm not a Hyper-V expert, this is basically all I know about it, and um, you know, I'm, I'm here to write exploits, right? I'm here to find vulnerabilities. And so once we have this level of context for Hyper-V, which is all you're gonna need for the rest of the, the talk, uh, we are going to be looking into a specific component. Uh, and this component is VM switch. VM switch is uh, just a VSP that provides network access to the guest. Uh, there's really nothing fancy here. Um, it's basically the same diagram I was showing you earlier, except that VM switch uh, is going to be accessing the network card instead of the hard disk. Uh, right. So the thing that you're going to notice here first is, uh, much like store VSP, VM switch uh, lives in the host OS kernel. So that means that if we are able to find a vulnerability in VM switch and compromise, uh, you know, the host through VM switch. Um, then we'll have full control over the host OS. We won't have to escalate out of user mode or anything, we'll just kind of be there, we'll be done, and it'll be great. So that makes it a pretty good target. The other thing um, to know about VM switch is the way that it works is it implements this um, protocol, which is the RNDIS protocol, which stands for Remote Network Device Interface something. And uh, basically that's a protocol that was introduced by uh, Microsoft a while ago uh, that is typically used to access network cards over USB. So really, VM switch you can kind of think of as a USB network card that is exposed over VM bus, 
I'm really simplifying things, but that's basically how it works. And so um, thinking about how to interact with VM switch, you're going to have two types of messages, right? You're going to have v messages that you send to VM switch to kind of set up VM switch, uh, tell it, okay, this is a protocol version I want to use, these are the buffers I want to use, this is the size of the packets I want to send, and so on. And then you're going to have the second layer of messages, which are these R and this messages which are going to let you interact with VM switch basically in the same way that you would interact with a you know, USB network card, right? And so knowing that, it kind of makes sense to start looking at the initialization sequence of VM switch, right? Like I mentioned, so think of it like to the left, once again, you have the host, to the right, you have the guest. And uh, so bringing up VM switch is basically just sending a few, a sequence of a few messages. The first thing is going to be agreeing on which, um, uh, on which protocol versions to use. So you're going to have the protocol version for VM switch that I first sent, then the protocol version for uh, the actual R and DIS protocol that I sent. Um, and so that's, you know, basically that's just how it works. And then be, after that, you're going to be sending these uh, receive buffers and send buffers. So the receive buffer and send buffer are basically what's going to be used. So first off, they are shared pieces of memory. They are G paddles. Uh, so the guest OS allocates them in its own memory space, sends it over through VM bus to the host OS, the host OS maps it, and then they're going to be used to basically transfer R and DIS packets. Uh, the reason to use those rather than just VM bus directly is what I was saying earlier that, um, well, this is exactly the kind of case that you would not want to use VM bus for all the time because network packets are going to be large, they're going to be happening at very high frequency, so a ring buffer is really not ideal for that, especially since things can happen out of order and all that. So basically, you, we introduce the send buffer, which is going to be used by the guest to send packets, and the receive buffer, which is going to be used by the guest to receive packets, and uh, that's just basically you can think of those as alternative uh, communications channels uh, that the uh, that VM switch is going to use. So in terms of looking a little more uh, in detail at how these receive buffers and send buffers look, uh, like how they work, um, right, so we, we said we have these messages that sets them up in the, in the host OS. So we send them over, we send the, this big blob of memory for each the, the receive buffer and the send buffer. The thing is we want to be able to send and receive more than one packet at a time, so what happens is the host OS is responsible for subdividing the uh, receive buffer and the send buffer into smaller sub allocations. The reason for that is you want to be able to send and receive more than one packet at a time because again, networks are nightmare and there's a lot of packets all the time and uh, you have to deal with that. And so the important thing here is the host OS is the one who makes that decision uh, and sends back those bounds for sub allocations. Next, if we have a, uh, the guest wants to send an R and DIS packet, in this case it's a query packet, which just means, you know, asking for things like the MAC address or, or something like that from the, from the host, uh, is going to generate its R and DIS packet locally, is then going to send it into the send buffer, just copy it into the send buffer, because once again it's a piece of shared memory, and once that happens, it's going to send a message over VM bus to let the, the host VM switch know, like, hey, there's a message, um, there's a packet in my send buffer, please read it, please take care of it. Once the host sees that, it's going to copy it into its own memory space, it's then going to acknowledge to uh, the guest that, okay, I've read it out, you can now use this send buffer for something else, like the send buffer sub allocation for something else, then it's going to handle it, and then it's going to copy the completion message into the receive buffer, let the guest know that there's a, uh, a packet in the receive buffer sub allocation number two, and then the guest is going to copy that and you know take into account that uh, whatever has happened and acknowledge to the guest uh, to, to the host that okay we're done we could you can now copy more stuff into this receive buffer sub allocation. So that's that's basically how it works in terms of sending and receiving uh, the R and DIS uh, messages. What's interesting here is that we're not just using the receive buffers. We're still also sending these things over VM bus. And um, the thing that's kind of interesting about that is the reason to use the receive buffers and the send buffers, as far as I can tell, is uh, to kind of have this really highly parallelized way of uh, handling those messages. Um, and you know, having this level of asynchronicity, even though, um, but the thing is like VM bus by its very nature, because it's a ring buffer, everything is serialized, so it kind of doesn't entirely make sense, right? How, how do you marry the two? So looking more specifically at how the host OS VM switch handles those messages, it doesn't uh, just handle them directly, and so we're gonna take a look at that. Uh, let's say you have the guest that has sent these two messages through the send buffer, uh, it lets uh, the host OS know through um, uh, through through VM bus. The host OS receives them. 
uh, and then instead of just handling them directly, it's going to copy them into a queue and then acknowledge that it has received them. Then it's going to do the same thing for the second message, put it into a queue, acknowledge that it has received that message, and you know that's basically it at that point. And the reason for that is that once again, you know, all of the MBUS messages are handled uh, in a very serialized way, and this is all in a single thread, and you don't want to be stalling that thread for however long it takes to actually handle those messages, which is why they're put in a queue, and then they are actually handled by these two separate worker threads, which you can think of as actually belonging to VM switch. So then they're going to be used there, they're going to be copied out of the queue, they're going to actually be handled, and then the results are going to be copied from, um, uh, fr they're going to be copied into the receive buffer by the actual worker thread as opposed to the VM bus thread. And, you know, I know all these details are kind of boring, but they will all come up later, so uh, try to pay attention. Um, and so after that, the, uh, the host OS is going to acknowledge that has, you know, finished this message. It has placed the completion message into the receive buffer. It's going to do the same thing uh, for, the, for the other message, uh, acknowledge it to the guests, and that's basically it. Okay, so once again, you're now complete VM switch experts, at least as far as I know. Uh, I don't really know much more about VM switch than that, and uh, I'm gonna try and now walk you through how I actually found the vulnerability that I did and how I exploited it and all that. So, we just took a look at the VM switch initialization sequence. Um, you know, sending a few packets, first negotiating the, the protocol version and all that so that every end knows what to talk about. Uh, but one way to kind of find vulnerabilities typically is, you know, you have these very well-defined sequences. What if you mess with that sequence, right? What if you send one message before the other, or what if you send one message multiple times, like do things, do interesting things happen? Turns out interesting, interesting things do happen if you send a receive buffer multiple times. Uh, so for example here, we're gonna have the guest define gpal0, so shared memory between the guest and the host, and it's going to send first receive buffer, and it's like, okay, the host is going to map gpal0 as its receive buffer, and you have a pointer that points to it. Totally cool. After that, it is going to, uh, it's going to do a second gbattle. And instead of sending it as a send buffer, it's going to send it as a receive buffer. And what happens here is interesting, is that the receive buffer pointer is updated. Right? It now points to gpal1 instead of gpal0, even though we are not actually supposed to be able to have more than one receive buffer. In fact, there's no longer any reference to the old gpal0 mapping in the host OS VM switch. It's just kind of there. It's still mapped there. And, well, that doesn't seem like a huge deal, but yeah, if you keep doing it, it just keeps happening. And at that point, you may be thinking, okay, well, that's kind of weird, but at worst, it's probably just a, a memory leak, right? Because you keep mapping more and more memory into the host. And even then, you're really just mapping more and more physical memory. Uh, you're not really allocating new stuff into like the host uh, pool or anything. So even if it is a memory leak, it's probably kind of tiny and insignificant. But the thing that's interesting is if you look at the way that the receive buffer is initialized and in turn how it's updated because it turns out we are able to send the receive buffer more than once, uh, that operation is not atomic. And because you know the team did not necessarily expect the ability from an attacker to send more than one receive buffer, there is also no locking on this operation. And so if you take a look at how the, uh, the buffer update works, there are three steps, right? Because the first step, is what I was just showing in this slide before, is updating the receive buffer pointer, right? So that's pretty straightforward. The thing is, as mentioned before, the host OS is also uh, responsible for uh, generating sub-allocations into that receive buffer, and then sending them back to the guest OS. And so that's actually what the, st the second step is, is actually generating that uh, list of sub-allocations inside of the, the, uh, of, the, of, the, um, of the receive buffer, and then the third step is to actually update those sub-allocations. Um, and so it might not seem like a huge deal, but if you take a look at how this works, uh, let's assume that we have gpaddle 0 and gpaddle 1 both mapped into the guest o into host OS, uh, and the, host the guest OS decides, okay, let's use gpaddle 0 as our receive buffer. So um, the host OS is like, okie dokie, here we are, we have a pointer, uh, and now we have sub-allocations to that receive buffer, it's all good. But now, uh, the guest OS is being annoying, it's telling it to use the uh, gpal1 instead of gpal0 as a receive buffer. Well, the first step is to uh, update the pointer to the receive buffer, right? And so, as that happens, first step, the pointer is going to be updated, and implicitly, the sub-allocation bounds are all going to be applied to this new receive buffer. And in this specific case, because we have gpal1 smaller than gpal0, those sub-allocation bounds are actually going to go out of bounds of that receive buffer. And, uh, well, I mean, I don't really need to tell you that it's not a great thing. 
Um, and the, of course, you know, if you let it go, if you let it generate its new sub, -alloc uh, sub allocation bounds, and you kind of like let it go all the way to sub three, it's totally fine. After that, you know, you end up with a perfectly valid receive buffer, like a really good receive buffer, uh, and it's totally possible to use it. Unfortunately, you do end up with like this tiny window during step two where you are able to potentially write data out of bounds from that receive buffer. And, um, well, it is like a really tiny window, right? Uh, this is basically generating the suballocations for receive buffer. Um, that's really just dividing the size of the receive buffer by the number of suballocations and then, you know, um, generating like some data structures and stuff. So it's really just a few, probably a few hundreds of cycles. Uh, but it is a possibility, right? Because as mentioned earlier, we do have these RNDIS worker threads that are running in the background working on RNDIS packets. And so if those are running while you update these sub allocations and you can somehow make them write to the receive buffer as the sub allocations are being generated, then you'll be able to write data out of bounds. And so that's basically the vulnerability. Um, and now, in terms of exploiting it, you really have to deal with three things, which are kind of annoying. The first thing is, okay, can we even control what's going to be written to this receive buffer? Because once again, this is going to be written by the RNDIS worker threads, uh, not by data that you necessarily directly control as the guest OS, so that might be tricky. Second thing is, can we even win the race? As mentioned, this is a really, a fairly tight race, and again, you're doing this from the guest OS, but you are not the one that is directly racing the host OS. You've basically got to get the host OS to race itself. And, well, I mean, that's kind of annoying. And the third thing, of course, is, okay, even if we do have the ability to, re to, to you know, hit the race and control what's being written, uh, can we even put a useful corruption target behind the receive buffer? Because typically, you know, at least for me, in my experience for kernel exploitation, I'm used to having an out-of-bounds write out of a pool buffer, right? I don't know where these shared buffers are mapped. This is not in the pool for sure. Uh, so got to take a look at that and try to figure out if I can do anything useful with that. And that's what we're going to get into right now. So the first thing is, can we even write useful data to the receive buffer out-of-bounds? Um, the short answer is yes. It's actually not that difficult. If you take a look at how the uh, RNDIS... Um, the RNDIS protocol works. Uh, basically, every message that you send to your network card is going to have a complete message. And some of the complete messages, such as the complete message for the uh, RNDIS query message, uh, include a, um, you know, a buffer at the end, a buffer that can contain arbitrary data. And so basically, um, the kind of data that you're going to be querying through this is going to be stuff like I mentioned earlier, for example, uh, the network card's MAC address, right? And these are things that you might be able to set through the RNDIS uh, set message. So basically the idea from here is you're gonna like find an OID that is handled by a VM switch uh, that lets you set some data that can be returned through the query message. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into detail in terms of like which messages actually allow you to do that, but this is the basic idea. It's really simple. And from that you can actually control a fair amount of data that is going to be written out of bounds and you actually even control the length that's gonna be written, and at that point, uh, you know, that's it's like, yay, we got number one down. <laughs> um, number two is a little trickier. Uh, how do we win that race? Uh, well, the first thing to know is, uh, you know, we've been talking about how these uh, RNDIS messages are, be, are being handled um, in parallel in, in the background by these worker threads, right? And so ideally what you would want is, oh, okay, maybe you have this queue, right? Maybe I can just like queue a bunch of messages and they're all gonna be handled in the background one after the other and each one is going to be completed and going to be written to the receive buffer. Unfortunately, if you take a look at what happens if you try to do that, so here we have like two worker threads. Practice there's actually five, but let's say there's only two. Uh, you have these two worker threads, there's three messages uh, that are queued, and what happens is the worker threads each pick up a message, uh, it handles it, um, then it writes it to receive buffer, and after that you would expect it to actually grab the third message and handle it. Unfortunately, no. Uh, what happens after that is because they alert the guest that, hey, there's something to grab in the receive buffer right now, you should go and do that, um, it's going to actually wait for the guest to say, okay, yeah, I grabbed it from the receive buffer, and uh, you can now use that slot in the receive buffer once again. Um, so basically, unless the guest actually sends one of these acknowledges, uh, acknowledgement messages, uh, these worker threads are just gonna be stuck. And once you do receive an acknowledgement message, 
uh, it's not going to be stuck anymore. It's just going to keep handling message after message after message. The problem is, in our case, uh, these acknowledgement messages have to be sent over the VM bus channel, which once again is completely serialized. And that's also uh, being, uh, that's also the channel that we have to send the new receive buffer over. And so basically, the receive buffer message and the acknowledgement message cannot ever be handled at the same time. So you cannot actually unlock this thread as you are trying to hit the race, which is kind of the problem. So that's one idea down. Um, but if you think about it, the very reason that these messages are, that these worker threads are being blocked until it receives, the, it receives an acknowledgement from the guest is that, as mentioned, they all kind of like use a few slots of the receive message, uh, of the receive buffer. And, you know, they want to make sure that whatever is in those slots has been read out before they write something else to them. But so, and so that's a problem because every message in the Arndis uh, protocol actually has a complete message, and so every message that you send over is going to be doing that. And it's going to be writing to receive buffer and waiting for it. Unless you take a look at the failure paths. Um, fortunately, uh, if you look at how VM switch uh, handles certain Arndis messages, uh, it turns out that certain failure paths will cause it to never try to write to the receive buffer. It's just going to return uh, you know, an error, and it's just going to skip that message and jump to the next message in the queue. And so uh, there's this idea then of uh, the uh, cascade of failure, which is also the title of my autobiography. Uh, biography. Um, cascade of failure being that, okay, you're just going to queue a bunch of messages that are going to fail, and that's going to create a sufficient time differential that you are able to control as an attacker such that you can try to hit the race. Because maybe we can't get messages to continuously write to the receive buffer, but all we really need is one buffer, like one message to write to the receive buffer. And the only difficulty then is like we need to be able to control when that message is going to be written to the receive buffer. But if we are able to have an arbitrary number of messages fail before that, then we'll be fine. And so trying to visualize that, you can see, uh, you can imagine, okay, each worker thread is already handling uh, an actual valid message. Okay. It's going to handle it. It's going to send it back to the, to the guest. And then it's going to be blocked. Then the guest is going to send one acknowledgement over VM bus. And that's kind of what's going to start this whole cascade. You can see uh, Arndis messages three through seven uh, are each have like that little uh, crash thingy there. That just means it's a malformed packet. And so as soon as it's going to be tried to be handled, it's going to go into there. It's going to fail. And then it's just going to go to mess next message and next message and next message. And as you can tell, that took a few seconds. So in practice, that would just be like a few you know, microseconds or nanoseconds or whatever. But the whole point is that we created this time differential. And from there, um, this actual last message is going to be written to the receive buffer. And so if you control that data, then we're all good. The only difficulty with that is, well, uh, you know, you want to win that race, but you don't actually know how long you want to wait, right? You, and you don't even know how long you are going to be waiting by. You only know that the amount of time, like this time differential that you're creating, is proportional to the number of messages that are going to fail. But you don't know how long like one message failure is going to take, right? And you also don't know how long you're going to want to wait. So it's kind of annoying. But maybe we are able to distinguish between uh, the race being too early, like us being too early in the race, or us being too late in the race. And if we're able to do that, then we can just adjust the number of failure messages to increase if we're too early, or decrease if we're too late. And so taking a look at what happens if you're too early, well, if you're too early, you're actually just going to be writing to the old receive buffer with the correct suballocation bounds. And so your message ends up in here. And since the receive buffer is something that is shared between the guest and the host, well, as a guest, you can just like read from that receive buffer and, and see that, oh, okay, we were too early. Let's try again. If you're too late, it's going to be the same thing, but with the new receive buffer. Um, because uh, we will, if you don't hit the race, inherently, you are going to be writing into the bounds of one of your receive buffers. And so the only difference is which receive buffer are you writing into, and you're able to distinguish those because, as a guest, you are able to read from that memory. And so if you're just right, though, well, you're not going to see anything in either of those receive buffers because, by definition, you're writing out of bounds, which is what you want. And at that point, all you have to do is celebrate. So we are able to win the race, and we're able to write arbitrary data out of bounds. It's pretty great. The only thing is, we still have no idea where our buffer is. We have no idea where we're actually corrupting. Um, it's kind of annoying. Uh, so, you know, pulling up KD, doing bang address, what you're going to see is that 
um, well, there's a bunch of other GPALs and other MDLs are uh, allocated into that memory region. But the other thing that is allocated in that memory region, which is really nice, is kernel thread stacks. Uh, and that is a very juicy attack target. Because really, all you have to do is like overwrite one return address on there, you get ROP, and you're done. So it's kind of a blessing. Um, the only thing is, you know, um, it's also not. Because <laughs> it turns out, um, you know, if, if you have this allocator, right, and you want to somehow place one target after your buffer, you need to be able to basically massage the allocator into doing that. The difficulty is, as a guest OS, you're not, you don't really have any control over what threads are going to be created in the host OS, at least not directly. And so that means uh, if you can't create new threads in the host OS, you can't create new stacks. If you can't create new stacks, you're going to have to try to corrupt an existing stack, and that's also difficult. So there's basically three things to deal with. It's, okay, first off, how does this allocator even work? Secondly, uh, can we, you know, place a stack at a known address? And in order to do that, well, in known offset, in order to do that, we actually also need to be able to place a stack in the first place. So a lot of non-trivial stuff. Um, well, first thing is, well, actually, the, the allocator is kind of trivial. Uh, it's kind of nice. Uh, so this, the name of this region that contains these MDLs and all these stacks is uh, system PTE region. Uh, and the allocator for that is just a bitmap based allocator. So what you can see to the right, it's an artistic representation of this bitmap. Uh, in orange, you're going to see uh, bit ones, which um, you know, uh, mean that a page is allocated. Uh, and blue is gonna be bit zero, which means that a page is not allocated. And the way that this allocator works is basically it has this little yellow arrow in there. That yellow, that, that yellow arrow is called the hint, and that's basically a heuristic for uh, where the uh, bitmap allocator is going to start scanning into the bitmap. And so in terms of allocating something into that, uh, that memory region, it's actually really simple. The allocator just scans the bitmap. If it finds a group of bits that are contiguous, that are big enough for what you want, it's just going to place that memory there. If it doesn't, it's going to add some more memory. So as an example, let's say we want to allocate five pages. The hint is right in the middle there. It's right before a big free region. And so it actually does already have five pages right available there. It's just going to allocate it and update the hint to go after that allocation such that you don't have to scan that again next time. Let's say you want to allocate five pages again. Well, you don't have uh, five pages immediately available, so that little arrow is just going to scan the bitmap and find five pages here, allocated there, and then you are going to be done. Now let's say you want to allocate 17 pages. Well, you actually don't really have any, uh, you know, free memory in there uh, that has 17 uh, contiguous pages. So instead it's going to expand the bitmap. It does that in groups of two megabytes and then place those 17 pages there and uh, that, that's that. Uh, the annoying thing if you end up doing that is that the hint is not actually updated, uh, which can come in handy or can become annoying based on what you're trying to do. Um, you know, just something to know. Now, okay, so we understand how the allocator works. It's actually pretty simple, but we need to be able to interact with that allocator in a meaningful way. We need two things. We need to actually be able to ideally allocate arbitrary amounts of data arbitrary times. And that's actually really easy because we have this vulnerability where we are able to map receive buffers and send buffers over and over and over again. And since these are gpaddles, and gpaddle size is controlled by the attacker because it's controlled by the guest OS, you can basically allocate any piece of memory of any size, which is a really nice primitive. The next thing is, we need to be able to allocate new kernel thread stacks such that we can place them after our receive buffer. Uh, and that's, that's actually really annoying. Uh, once, as I mentioned, there's like really no good way, like there's obviously no by design way to do that from a guest. Uh, and so the best way that I, I found how to do that is to uh, notice that VM switch and a lot of uh, VM bus based services actually uh, rely on the NT uh, system worker uh, thread pool. The reasoning being that once again, VMs, VM bus messages are all serialized. You'd rather be doing that in parallel. So basically it'll read a message, submit a task to the worker pool, then the worker pool is going to take on that task, handle it, and in the meantime, like the VM bus thread can like go on to uh, handling another VM bus message. But so the way that a thread pool works is whenever it gets a task, if there's a, three, a, a, a free thread inside that pool, it's just going to use that thread, right? And so no new thread is created, a new new stack, which is not great for us. But if there is, if all the other threads are already busy, it's going to actually create a new thread, add it to the pool, and that's going to create a new stack. So the idea is basically just kind of find a message that is easy enough to hit and will submit a task to that pool, 
and just kind of flood it. Just, just send a bunch of them. And, uh, and the host OS is going to uh, be submitting all of those to the NT uh, kernel worker thread pool. And eventually, well, it'll create some new messages, uh, some new, some new threads. And that's still going to create some new stacks. And ideally, it'll place it where we want. Uh, I was also helped by the fact that VM switch at the time had a uh, tiny bug which would cause uh, certain uh, worker threads to be deadlocked and it would just like wait on a mutex forever, uh, which was kind of annoying, but also actually came in really handy because that way you can just make sure that in, like any arbitrary number of worker threads that you want is just going to stay uh, you know busy forever and that lets you allocate new ones. So at this point, it's like, okay, we basically have a really hacky way of, uh, of creating new kernel thread stacks. Ideally, we really only want to be able, uh, we really only want to have to like spawn a single one. And so that's where we have to go into how to massage the, the, the heap, well, like the kernel, uh, the system PT region. And basically, um, just have like these five steps that kind of just work. The idea being of like, first we want to spray one megabyte blocks. Uh, and uh, we do that in order to kind of fill in these gaps to make sure that our later al allocations will not be going all the way up in there. So we do that by spraying a bunch of receive buffers or send buffers or whatever. Uh, it's pretty simple. And the next thing is we want to allocate a buffer that is equal to in length to two megabytes minus one page. And the reason for that is if we, this is the maximum size that we can allocate that it will create a new region uh, like a new two megabyte region expansion at the bottom of the bitmap without actually like putting it somewhere else. And the reason that it's interesting is that this is actually going to be our receive buffer. If you'll recall, we need to actually hit the race several times before we are actually uh, able to, uh, to hit the right number of failure messages. And so you want to be able to place your uh, buffer in a location where you know that the next time you have an allocation, it will end up in the, in, in the same location. Uh, because we want to be able to repeat that race over and over and over again. And so making it the biggest size possible uh, allows us to do that. And then you just allocate a one megabyte buffer that's just basically to take care of, uh, of possible alignment issues. I'm not going to get into that, but that's, there's something in the appendix for that. Uh, and after that, you're going to allocate something that is one megabyte minus the size of the kernel stack. And then that's going to update the hint. And because the hint is right before uh, that thing there, you can just allocate a new stack. It's going to be there. And uh, you end up being able to place a kernel stack at in, you know, not an arbitrary offset from the, uh, from the receive buffer, but a known offset. That's really all you want. Because at this point, then we can manufacture our receive buffers in such a way that we know that the suballocation that we care about will be placed to overlap with that uh, kernel stack. So we're good. Uh, at this point, we have uh, filled in all three of those requirements, and we are actually able to write, uh, write memory out of bounds, and everything's awesome. The only thing is, uh, since we were corrupting kernel thread stack, we actually need to bypass KSLR. Um, as you probably, hopefully know, in the host OS, uh, all memory is kind of randomized. So we don't really know, um, you know, we, we'll, well, we want to overwrite a thread stack. The reason we want to overwrite, overwrite the thread stack is to overwrite a return address. We can't overwrite a return address unless we know what to overwrite it with. So we need to know the location of some code in the host OS uh, in order to do that. And so that's what uh, bypassing KSLR means, is just finding the address of a piece of code that is known. Um, and the first way to do that is actually just to find an info leak. Um, and so uh, the info leak that I found for this, uh, for this exploit is actually really uh, like quite simple. Basically, this is how these, um, like this is the structure that is used by both the host OS and the guest OS for VM switch messages. And you have this union, right? The thing about unions is not every member of a union has to be the same length. And so for example, you have like one message to the left here that has one more field than the one to the right. Uh, and that's totally fine, except that, you know, once you do size of that struct, it's going to be used at the same size everywhere. And that means that if you allocate that structure on the stack, never fully initialize it, and just send over, like, the entire size of that structure, well, you return a bunch of uninitialized stack bytes. And uninitialized stack bytes are pretty great for us because they typically contain return addresses. And so we're able to get a return address from VM switch, which is awesome. And with that return address, we are able to, um, you know, build a ROP chain and get code execution and all that fun stuff. And so we're done. Except we're not. Uh, as it turns out, the info leak is awesome, but it only worked on older versions of Windows. At the time, that was uh, Windows Server 2012 R2. So we were actually targeting Windows 10, so oops. Uh, let's find something else. <laughs> 
And actually, that new method, that other method that we're going to talk about, does not include a new vulnerability. It's just a way of, uh, you know, dealing with KSLR without, you know, finding a new bug. And the thing to know about KSLR on Windows, at least for, for drivers, is that each driver is going to be aligned to this 0x10,000 byte boundary. So what that means is that if you overwrite the lower two bytes of an address within that module, well, you can change the offset within the module without having any information about where the module is. And so if you'll recall, we have the ability to write arbitrary data at, you know, semi-controlled offset inside of the host, uh, inside of like that kernel thread stack. So that means that we can totally just overwrite the lower two bytes of something. So what you can see as an example down there is we have this actual valid return address on the stack, and instead we overwrite the lower two bytes, and then it's going to point towards a ROP gadget. In this case, just pop R15 ret, which is not really useful. And that's kind of the thing, though. It's like, okay, we can jump to a ROP gadget, cool. Uh, but we only have like 0x10 bytes, which is like 64K of range or something. And, uh, well, we can't really do anything useful with just one ROP gadget. Or can we? Uh, thinking about the allocations again, right? We had this thread stack right after our receive buffer. And we still have the ability to map more shared memory. So what if we allocated, like, say, a send buffer right before, right after the thread stack? And we have this shared memory between the guest and the host right after the thread stack. And then we have the ability to jump to one ROP gadget. Well, this ROP gadget is pretty great because it's just going to do RSP plus equals like almost a whole page worth of data. And so thinking about it, you have like the thread stack at the, at the top here on the right. You have this, um, you know, you have this, uh, this return address there. You overwrite it to jump to that ROP gadget. Okay. And then what's going to happen? RSP is going to go from your kernel thread stack right into shared memory. So, okay, this is cool. We can, like, control more data that's going to be interpreted as being the stack. That's nice. But, of course, once you hit ret, well, it's just going to crash because uh, the guest to us doesn't really have any way of knowing what to put in there. That's the whole point. We're trying to get an ASLR bypass. But what's cool about that is it's going to crash. And when an x86 uh, CPU crashes, at least on Windows, it's going to put the return address of where the crash happened onto the stack, which means that as a guest who has access to that shared memory, I can actually read back that return address of where the crash happened. And then the, um, the exception handler of Windows is going to be using my shared memory as a stack for the exception handling. And so as an attacker, I can both read and write from that, and I can redirect execution from the exception handler into anywhere I want. And so that's how you uh, bypass KSLR without info leak. Uh, you basically just move the stack into shared memory. Um, doesn't work for many things, but in this case, it came in pretty handy. So as a result, we have uh, ROP and by extension code execution on Windows 10 from a guest VM, which is cool, but let's see how that works in practice. I'm going to do a live demo. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah, I can't see shit. Um, just a second. Just making sure I can actually see the screen. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is uh, running uh, Windows Server 2012 R2. Uh, this is running on this little laptop here, which is not a server, but you know, whatever. And this is a, uh, a VM here, right? So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pop up my uh, super elite hacker shell. And I first wanna grab the uh, VM bus channel that is being used um, by VM switch. Okay, so let's just return the address of that in the guest OS. I want to check that my info leak actually works. Um, swear to God. <laughs> okay, uh, that just hung. It didn't crash or anything. It just it's just hanging there. <sighs> okay, I guess no live demo. <laughs> Uh, okay, I'm gonna keep going and try to get that working uh, as possible. But this was supposed to work. This is supposed to be really cool. <laughs> uh, so let's keep going. Uh, in the meantime, uh, in the meantime, what's happening? Uh, what's happening is uh, what we want to do is okay. So we have this uh, exploit, which, as you just saw, works super well, super reliable, is really awesome. And based on that, we have like this whole host of data we just got, right? <laughs> 
And so the data that we get from like writing these exploits is it's a couple things. It's first like the, the vulnerability discovery, right? It's a little process. Now we are able to know, okay, where to look for uh for for more um for, you know for more vulnerabilities, how do we want to do that? The the best way for us to do that really for, for vulnerabilities is either going to be introducing mitigations that we believe are actually going to um, you know kill certain um, certain types of, uh, of vulnerabilities, but that's typically difficult. And instead, what we want to do uh, most likely is going to be stuff like uh, a lot of code review internally, or uh, you know, introducing a bug bounty that pays out two hundred fifty thousand dollars for working exploit. The next thing we can do is learn from our uh, exploit uh, techniques that we use, and hopefully introduce some new. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once. It's really difficult. <laughs> uh, yeah, so in introduce some new um, some new mitigations that will break these exploit techniques, and so um, in order to, and, and so we kind of did that. And in addition to like kind of trying to break the whole post exploitation game, right? In terms of breaking the post exploitation game, it's not necessarily going to be introducing more mitigations, although that's definitely a part of it. It's going to be rearchitecting things in such a way that uh, you know we make the targets less interesting. And so, uh, in terms of mitigations that we introduce, uh, the First and most obvious thing I think is just going to be separating the kernel stacks from uh, the rest of memory. Uh, the reasoning between, behind that is that this way you will never be able to overflow from any buffer into a, a kernel stack, and so that's just better not only for Hyper-V, which has all these, um, you know, has all these buffers that are handling um, that that are uh, working in in, uh, in that same memory region. But also for uh, other, you know, drivers that use MDLs and map physical memory and all that. Uh, and so, so that's the first mitigation. The, the second thing that we can uh, look into is more, much more uh, general mitigations, things like HVCI, so hypervisor enforced code integrity, which makes it such that attackers cannot uh, inject new unsigned code into the host OS kernel. Uh, in addition to that, we have things like KCFG, uh, which uh, you know is uh, preventing the uh, takeover of uh, certain function pointers. Uh, and, and things like that in the host OS kernel. And so that's just like very general hardening that we are definitely doing. And like these features have existed for a little while, but now there's like more and more effort to uh, make it happen uh, by default on more platforms. In addition to that, we are actually investing uh, with Intel and other partners in security features that are actually implemented in the hardware. Uh, the main one of those that would actually totally apply to this exploit is CET, which is going to be a um, you know a hardware implemented shadow stack, which is going to make it such that you cannot just overwrite a return address with whatever the whatever you want, and that prevents ROP and that prevents this exploit in addition to other stuff. Uh, in terms of more architectural uh, changes that would change the post exploitation game, uh, you've got you've got okay, this worked. Uh, we are going to switch back to this demo uh, as soon as I can connect back in there. Uh, but yeah, so the thing I was saying is you actually have certain VSPs that live in the, uh, the host OS user mode, and the reason that that's interesting is that um, the host OS user mode uh, is going to be isolated on a per VM basis. So if you break into a VM worker process, well, you've only really broken into one VM's worker process. Unlike this, where you're going to see, you actually are able to do a lot of things. Uh, so hopefully, so this actually shows that the exploit actually worked. Um, and I'm just going to skip a few things. Uh, let's see. Uh, first, wanna, so this is actually listing the processes in the, the host OS from the guest OS, right? So you have a list of this. And well, I mean, you don't really have like uh, any reason to believe that any of this is legitimate, because anyone can come up with a list of PIDs. But let's see if we can inject a DLL into the host OS uh, explorer.exe. <laughs> yes, we can. I was like, okay, this is cool. Uh, that actually worked for once. Well, not for once. Uh, but so, so yeah, so the thing was, uh, in addition to that, I'm also running a second VM on this machine because I want my demos to be really complicated. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna like kind of log into that VM, no particular reason. And from the original guest, uh, not kissed, can actually list what other partitions are living in there. Okay, so you have two and three. I'm gonna guess that we're two, because, uh, sure. And then we can actually grab the other guest. Okay, it's going to kind of hook into the other VM. 
And at this point, we are actually able to, come on. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. So there were a few more things for the demo, but, uh, you know, first failure kind of breaks things. Anyway, uh, I have about three seconds left. So the whole point is like, yeah, you have one VM worker process per VM, and so if you break into that VM worker process in one of those VFPs, VSPs that is in the worker process, well, you've only really broken into that worker process. If you want to have full access to all the other VMs, like I just showed you, you still need to escalate to like a uh, kernel level. And so this is uh, something that we're definitely uh, trying to invest in, in terms of, well, we are actually hardening also the worker process, even more so than the kernel. Um, you know, improvements to sandbox, improvements to RCE mitigations. In addition to that, you know, we are trying to move more and more uh, Hyper-V components into user mode because it's just a much better security posture. And, um, uh, okay, now my slides have, okay. And the last thing I want to talk about is just the Hyper-V bounty. So what I just demoed here, assuming it had worked the first time, is worth $250,000 to Microsoft. And keep in mind, this is about a month's work of work. So if you want to make, you know, one, two, or three years worth of salary in, in a month, uh, please submit to our bounty. Uh, <laughs> pay really well. Um, and there's actually more and more resources out there in terms of uh, getting started. Uh, one good thing, one good resource to like get started is uh, actually a talk that was yesterday uh, by uh, Joe Bialik and uh, Nico. Uh, so the slides should be available online. In addition to that, we actually have a lot of really well documented guest side driver code that is um, in on GitHub. So you can just like uh, click on that and figure out how these VSPs work just by looking at VSC source code. Really well documented, honestly, maybe better documented than some internal code. And in addition to that, we have been uh, publishing a bunch of Hyper-V uh, symbols. So uh, a lot for you to get started with, and hopefully we'll hear from you on the bounty. Thank you for your time.